All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone watching online. I'm thankful for Paolo, man. I always love watching you play. Thank you for you and your family leading us in prayer this morning. Also, David, always good to see you on the keyboard. Just a, a hand of encouragement for our team this morning, everybody. Welcome here. It's a special day. I want to let you know, um, if you're familiar with our storehouse ministry, the big building across the road, it's the world's greatest thrift department store. Can, can, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. The world's greatest thrift department store. And they had two sales this week, two sales in one week, Monday and Thursday, right? All right, so come on. If you've got things that you would like to donate, you can donate them 24 hours a day. There's a drop-off, and everything they sell goes to help us in our local, national, and global missions efforts. It's an incredible ministry, and I'm so thankful for that team. So go buy you some good deals this week, and uh, goodness, uh, next Sunday, it's Baptism Sunday. If you've not been baptized, we'll have some baptisms, and also I hear that our student worship team is leading us again in worship next Sunday, so that's going to be uh, a, a fun day. Today uh, is a special day. We have uh, one of our found uh, Heritage Church started in this family's living room, uh, and Roy Reeves is sharing today. And just so you know what a special day it is, Heritage Church turned 27 years old yesterday, everybody. It's our birthday. It's our birthday weekend. So I, I want to I set this up, but before I do, I'm going to pray for our offering. For those that uh, want to give in person, here's your opportunity. If you're watching online, they'll provide links. Thank you for your giving. Uh, we have text-to-give options and online options and automatic giving that you can set up. But here in the house, we have an offering team. We have one basket per row. They'll just pass it to the end of your row, and you can just hold it there, and they'll collect it from you. Thank you so much for giving, uh, and I want to pray for our offering today. This is uh, a time of worship, of cheerful worship. So pray with me. Father, we love you. Thank you. Everything we have comes from you. And so today we say thank you. We worship you through our giving in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, listen, about Heritage Church is uh, 27 years old. And about that same time as Heritage was being birthed, um, goodness, uh, my life, honestly, personally, was falling apart. I didn't, I knew some of the founding fathers of our church, but didn't know about the launch of Heritage until a year or so into it. And uh, I had been in, I entered ministry at a ridiculously young age. I was 17 years old when I entered ministry. And that was a good recipe for disaster because I had gifts that got me promoted rapidly, but I didn't have maturity. And so it just set me up for a lot of responsibility without a great foundation. And I crashed and burned, uh, was actually kicked out of ministry and believed I would never again be in ministry. And it was a very difficult season of life, a painful season of life. And uh, through this process, I met a mentor who get, changed my whole perspective on life, uh, like changed those questions, those nagging questions that follow you around every day. It changed all of those. And he studied the Bible more than anyone I'd ever studied. He said, Brad, listen to me. Your best years are still ahead. Like your best years are meant to be your final season of life. He went through scripture and showed how without exception, those who do the greatest work of God, it's always in their last chapter of life. Because God the potter molds and shapes us and forms us through a lifetime using the good, the bad, our failures, our mistakes, all of that. He is working together for good to mold us into his image. And then when we are mature and complete, then he begins to position us to do our greatest ministry on earth. So the message for you today is it's not too late. You haven't messed up too much, and your best years are still to come because God's not finished with you, and he always saves the best wine for last. Come on, can I get a, a little amen to that? So this we've shared through the years, and if you're new with us, I want you to know one of our uh, the. Probably the value I hear repeated most often is this value of finishing well. 
God's not finished with you. Don't give up on him. And when you reach this later season of life, don't listen to the world that says it's time to check out, retire, and go play golf on a beach the rest of your days. No, now it's time to go to work and offer this world your greatest, most fruitful years of ministry. So today and this month, we're going to share with you principles for finishing well. Check this out, and let's get to work. The kingdom of God, it's compared to running a race, and God often saves our most impactful years for the last leg of the race. Some in our midst have been running faithfully for many years, and we believe their stories offer hope. These people aren't perfect, but their lives do point to the goodness and faithfulness of God. To us, their stories are legendary. These aren't just our heroes. These are our legends. Good morning. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23, one of the most beloved passages of Scripture in all of the Word. We're going to come back to Psalm 23 this morning. I want to give you just some perspectives and some overviews of finishing well as we get started and just to kind of set up today's message let me give you a definition to finish well is to walk with God personally at the end of life while you contribute to his purposes in his kingdom at some highly realized level of potential the most important thing about finishing well is that when you get in your latter years, you still got this vibrant, growing, maturing relationship with the Lord. And as you are in relationship with, you, with him, what's coming out of you is this potential that's been in you your whole life that he placed in you even before you were born. And now... That has matured and that has developed and it's just naturally coming out of you. That's what it means to finish well. It's the unique season of life when being and doing merge. Ministry flows out of maturity and there's less time is required to be impactful and influential. Can I just say to you as a person who's 63 years old, there's a lot of great things about getting older. There's a lot of great things about maturity, and one of them is, is that now it's more about being than it is about doing. And ministry is more of just an outflow of all the things that God has placed in you and all that God has deposited in you. I love this quote from the Given 15 devotion that says, For those who are finishing well... Climbing the ladder of success has gradually been replaced by plumbing the depths of his heart. Accomplishments are now measured more by heaven's approval than by earth's applause. Wow, if we can get to that place 
where we're more concerned about heaven's approval than earth's applause. And making a name has given way to making a difference. Now Brad, through the years, has warned us not many people finish well. And here's what Dr. Howard Hendricks, who was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, he summed that up this way by saying, there are 2,930 names mentioned in the scriptures. Of those names, we know there are about 100 of them that we know something concrete about their lives. So only about 100 biblical, biblical characters that we know something concrete about their lives. Out of those 100 only one-third finished well, and those that failed, failed in the last half of their life. Now, that's a pretty sobering statement to me. We're talking about biblical characters, and only one-third of them finished well, and those that failed, failed in the last half of their life. Now, last summer, uh, I led a lot in this series on finishing well and I used a football game analogy and so this morning I'd like to go back to that to use that as an analogy and I want to just say again that a win means finishing well as we talk about a football game this morning the win is going to be to finish well now I want to emphasize again and I hope you'll see this morning that this series is not just for the old folks because here's what you need to remember. What happens in each quarter of your life impacts the others. They build on each other. And so what happens throughout your life determines how you will finish the game. Now, if I were a football coach, I would want my team to play like this. I'd want to go out in the first quarter, get an early lead, Keep it going in the second quarter, go into halftime with the lead, come out and dominate in the third quarter, and then win the game in the fourth quarter. But the reality is that's not how most football games go, is it? And it's certainly not how our lives go. The reality, as Brad just said in the introduction, is a lot of us have some not-so-good quarters in our life. We have some not good, so good seasons in our life. But the great news is that doesn't disqualify you from finishing well. See, the bad news is, is you can have a really big lead going into the third or fourth quarter and lose the game. Most people do not finish well, as Dr. Hendricks reminded us. The good news is, is that you can be behind going into the fourth quarter and you can win the game. Think how many football games are won in the fourth quarter. As a matter of fact, does anybody remember Super Bowl 51? The Falcons versus the Patriots. Bad memory for us Falcons fans. In the middle of the third quarter, Atlanta was leading 28-3. Seems like an insurmountable lead. And they ended up losing the game 34 to 28 in overtime. You see, Atlanta had a terrible fourth quarter. They had been dominating for three quarters, and then they lost the game in the fourth quarter. But the good news is, is that the Patriots have sort of been had a lack, lack, lackluster performance for most of the game, and they came on strong in the fourth quarter, and they ended up winning. Now, I know this analogy of a football game is not perfect because we don't all live the same number of years. Some people seem to die uh, too young or too early, and then other people seem to have an extra long life. Maybe even seems like their life goes into overtime. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to divide life into four quarters, and I want you this morning to recognize where you are in your game of life. And so for each quarter, I'm going to use some generalities. And some of these may not apply to you. You may not be married or you may not have children. But what I want to do is talk about some of the major challenges that you're going to face in each quarter of life. And I want you to see how a specific part of Psalm 23 
applies to you. All right, so let's get started. Let's get started with quarter number one. Everybody that's zero to 20 years old. Now, these are the formative years of your life. What happens to you during childhood, adolescence, and your teen years has a tremendous impact on the rest of your life. Early on, the biggest influence in your life is your family of origin. Your grandparents, your parents, your siblings, um, aunts and uncles, cousins. Did you know that blessings and curses run in families? Blessing and curses run in families. The choices and decisions of your grandparents and your parents have a tremendous impact on your life. As the game begins, as your game begins, your life is set on a course that you have no control over. But as you enter childhood and you progress through the teen years, there are two other big influences that come into your life that have a huge impact on your life, and that's peer pressure and cultural influences. Now listen to me, young people. Listen to me, people who are in the first quarter of life. You didn't have a choice when it comes to your family, but you do have a choice when it comes to your peers. Peer pressure can be a good thing or a bad thing. And if you have the right peers, it's a good thing. All you first quarter folks, choose your peers wisely. Cultural influence. Wow. Our American culture seems to be changing exponentially fast. And from my perspective, most of that change doesn't seem to be headed in the right direction. Can I give you just an overly simple perspective on culture? You have a choice when it comes to culture. Do you choose to be impacted more by the culture of this world or by the culture of the kingdom of God? So here's the reality. The principles of the kingdom of God usually don't make sense in the kingdom of this world. Let me just give you one example. I see it right now, big time. The world is constantly saying to you, you ought to be offended. He did you wrong. She did you wrong. You need justice. Man, are we hearing that word a lot these days. These days, You need to take out your own vengeance. You know what the kingdom of God says? Lay down your offenses. If you want to live free, be better off. Don't even take up an offense. Forgive. Leave justice and vengeance to the powerful hand of God. That brings me back to Psalm 23 for all you people in the first quarter. There's one line in the psalm I want you to carry with you today, and it's the first one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If you go back to the Hebrew that this was originally written in, what that says is, Jehovah is my shepherd. And Jehovah, which means the existing one, is the proper name for the one true God. It's like, my name's Roy. His name is Jehovah. If the world is as it should be, you people in the first quarter would have experienced the nurture and care of a loving family. doesn't always happen that way and then you would begin to choose who or what is going to shepherd you along the way 
And the world is screaming out to all you people in the first quarter. Let me shepherd you. Let me lead you. Let me guide you. And so often, those things bring disappointments in our life. But Jehovah says, if you will let me shepherd you, I will guide you. I will lead you. I will give you life. I heard many years ago that three of the most important decisions that you'll make in your life are your master, your mate, and your mission. If you choose the right master, it has a tremendous impact on the other two. So I want to ask all the people in the first quarter to stand up. If you're below 20 years of age, I want to ask you to stand up. (laughs) All right, y'all do not qualify. All right. Here's my prayer for you. Is that you will choose, you will decide that Jehovah is going to be my shepherd. That Jesus, he's not just going to be my Lord. He's going to be my shepherd. He's the one that I'm going to count on to lead and to guide me. I want him to be my master. And you know what? I also pray that you will choose great peers. You know, it comes to mind, you can't soar with the eagles if you're hanging out with the turkeys. And so I pray that you choose good peers. And I pray that you will learn principles of the kingdom of God. And that you will choose to live by the principles of the kingdom of God, not by the principles of this world. Can we give it up for all the first quarter folks in our midst today? Let's talk about the second quarter. Everybody who's 21 to 40. For many people, this is one of the most, or this is the most stressful time of life. This is a time when most of us are choosing our mate and our mission. We're getting married. Two selfish people are leaving their family of origin to establish their own family, which is really exciting, but it's very challenging. This is a time when you're usually getting established in your job and career. And it's the time to answer that question that you've been asked most of your life. What do you want to be when you grow up? Having children and learning to be a good parent. And just going through all the stages of parenting. Navigating all those cultural influences that are now screaming at your kids like they used to scream at you. Middle school. God bless you if you're a parent of a middle schooler. Huge financial decisions. Buying a house. Borrowing money. And it's often during the second quarter that people get into debt traps. And make bad financial decisions and get way more debt than they can handle. This is the season where you need to learn to live on a budget. Man, I'm starting to feel stressed. Just thinking about all this stuff and some little flashes and memories of my life are coming back. Well, what does Psalm 23 just say to people who are in the second quarter? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Or waters of rest. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Well, I would just say all of you in the second quarter need that. You need a lot of that. You need a shepherd who's going to lead you. And again, just like people in the first quarter, a lot of things in the world are going to scream at you. Let me lead you. 
But the Lord, the Jehovah said, Lord God, Jehovah says, if you let him lead you, he will lead you to green pastures. And he will lead you to still waters. So often, we follow someone else's lead and we wind up in barren pastures. We were promised fulfillment, but when we got there, it was a disappointment. In the, in the midst of this turbulent time of your life where you have a lot of demand and a lot of responsibility, you need some still waters. You need some times of refreshment and replenishment. And then all of us, no matter what quarter we're in, we need soul restoration. You see, the reality is that most of us suffer some kind of soul wounds. And a lot of times our soul wounds happen in the first quarter of our life. And I hate to say this, but a lot of our soul wounds come at the hands of, the fam of our family of origin. Remember what I said, blessings and curses run in families. So you need restoration from the curses that you may have received from your family or you've just picked up in life along the way. Soul restoration should take place during your whole game, your entire life. But how great it is for that soul restoration to start early on in your life. If the Lord is your shepherd, ask him, allow him to restore your soul. If it happens, if you begin to experience soul restoration in your second quarter, let me tell you, it has a tremendously positive impact on the rest of your life. And it has a tremendously positive impact on the life of your children and really anybody else that you come in contact with. So I want to ask all the people in the second quarter to please stand up. Awesome. It's great to see so many of you here in church this morning. So here's what I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray that as you allow... Jehovah to be your shepherd that you will let him lead you that that would even be a prayer that you would pray every day Lord lead me today and as you go through stressful times of your life that you would pray Lord I need some green pastures I've been chewing on this one and there's no more grass here <laughs> I need some green pastures and you know what, Lord? I am stressed out. Can you take me to some quiet waters? Can you take me to some waters of replenishment and refreshment? Oh, and I pray that you begin to experience soul restoration. Don't run from those wounds. Don't run from those wounds that you may know that are in your life. Because let me tell you, if running from them, they're not going to go away. They're going to come back to you, and they're going to come back on you, and they're going to affect you and your family and really everybody that you come in contact with. you got a shepherd who wants to restore your so, and I pray that you seek after that and you allow him to restore your soul. Let's hear it for the people in the second quarter. Third quarter, people who are 41 to 60 years old. You know, life begins to feel more like you're in the zone. You're likely established in your job and you don't have as much responsibility, most people with really small children. However, issues where older children become a growing concern for many people in this quarter of life, especially in the culture that we are living in right now. Hopefully, hopefully you're stabilizing yourself financially. Or you're at least climbing out of the financial hole that maybe you dug in a previous quarter. 
Well, here's the big warning that I want to give you folks in the third quarter. You got to watch out for ruts and boredom because those things are what usually lead to a midlife crisis. If you've known the Lord for a while and you're in the third quarter, I just want to ask you this morning, is your relationship with the Lord still growing? Is it still vibrant? Or does it feel like maybe it's plateaued or it's gotten stale a little, little bit? What about your marriage? See, a lot of marriages just sort of begin to plateau and they feel stale. Matter of fact, I ran across an interesting study done by Growling... Bowling Green State University, and it um, compared the divorce rate in America in 1990 in 2017. From 1990 to 2017. And the great news is, which I was a little surprised by this, is that the over, overall, the divorce rate went down during that time period. From 1990 to 2017. And in every category of age groups it went down. Except for the age group of 45 to 64. The divorce rate increased during that time period. From age 45 to 64. Mostly in the third quarter. The divorce rate increased. Why is that? Well I'm sure there's lots of reasons but I think one of the major ones is that too many of us stop seeking to grow our marriage. We stop investing in our marriage in this stage of life. So I'll just ask you this morning, what about you? And it's also in this stage of life that many of us experience a new challenge. And we have to deal with the issues of aging parents or maybe other people in our family, other loved ones that we are called upon to help look after. And then a lot of us begin to face the death of some dear people in our life, some of our parents or, or other relatives. Jesus said in John 10.10 10, that Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's always trying to steal from you. He's always trying to kill you in some way. And ultimately, he wants to destroy your life. So in this season of life, in the third quarter, when things should be stabilizing, watch out for Satan's subtle attacks. Don't be ignorant about his schemes, as Paul warned us in uh, 1 Corinthians 2 and in Ephesians 6. You know what? The devil's always scheming against you. He's got a scheme with your name on it. This is how we're going after him. This is how we're going after her. Don't be ignorant of his schemes. So let's go back to Psalm 23 for all you in the third quarter. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, in the valley of deep darkness, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Third quarter, folks, don't let Satan take you out. If Jehovah is your shepherd, you don't need to fear evil even when you walk through a valley of deep darkness because your shepherd is with you. And he's got tools to protect you. The fact that he wants to protect you and is able to protect you should bring you a lot of comfort. You see, the shepherds of old had tools to help them protect the sheep. They had a rod, which was a hard piece of wood that was fashioned in such a way that they could throw it at a would-be predator and scare it away. And then they had the staff that was used to lead and guide and nudge the sheep, but also used to rescue them when they got in trouble third quarter folks don't blow your lead like the Atlanta Falcons you got to watch out for ruts don't get bored with life don't get bored in your relationship with the Lord don't plateau in your marriage avoid a midlife crisis and be aware of Satan's schemes can I ask all the people in the third quarter to stand up? Oh, man, they're grunting, they're grunting. 
Y'all are grunting too early. Not supposed to grunt in the third quarter. Here's what I want to pray for you guys. If you allow Jehovah to be your shepherd, you can walk with the confidence that he is with you and that he has the ability to protect you. So get up every day with that. Jehovah is my shepherd. And he has the ability, he's got the tools to protect me. And so I'm going to walk in that comfort. Hey guys, don't fall in a rut. And if you're in one today, when I was talking about it and you'd say, Hey, you know what, I think I'm in a rut. Crawl out. Don't stay in there. And don't let a midlife crisis derail you. And don't be ignorant of Satan's schemes. If you know something that he's used on you and it's worked in the past, come up with your shepherd a way to fight against those schemes. Let's hear it for all the people in the third quarter. All right, I got to fuel up for the last quarter. For all of us, and I say us because I'm, I'm there, 61 years old or older, I got some good news and some bad news. The bad news is you're in the fourth quarter. Your game is coming to an end. But I got some good news. You're in the fourth quarter. You're in the finishing well quarter. It's during this time of life that most people retire from their job. And as a general rule, you have less day-to-day responsibilities. Conversations usually include your latest physical ailment (laughs) and your next doctor's visit. But besides our ailments, what are some of the challenges that we face? Here's one. You got to watch out for the been there, done that mentality. People in this quarter may deserve to slow down, enjoy more of life, but we need to watch out seeking after and worshiping the God of comfort, where our default is always to choose. The comfortable thing. Anyone besides me feel that urge just to be comfortable? You've retired from working a job, but don't retire from life because you got 60 plus years of knowledge and wisdom and experience experiences that are unique to you and to your life. And the people in the other three quarters need the resources that you have to offer. Oh, that the church, oh, that this church had an army of people who were in the fourth quarter who saw themselves as spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. I ask you this morning, if you're in the fourth quarter, can you see yourself that way? Can you see yourself as a spiritual mother or a spiritual father? Because you see, there are so many people in the world that need somebody just to mother them or father them. 
And that could be me, mean you taking on like a discipleship role in their life. Or that could mean you being a mentor to them. Or get this. It could mean you just have a brief interaction with another person that can be life-changing to them. If you've got the mentality of, hey, I might be able to father that person right now. Or I might be able to mother that person right now. Psalm 23 has a lot to say to us in the fourth quarter. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a lot of good stuff. Lots of good stuff. The fourth quarter of your life should be a quarter of confidence. Confident to the point that you could sit down and eat a meal in the presence of your enemies. Because you know, not that you're so confident in yourself, but you are confident in the fact that your shepherd is leading you. He is protecting you. And he is going to give you the right kind of comfort. You see, through the Holy Spirit, God has gifted you in a unique way. Like I said at the beginning, that potential has been in you since you were in your mother's womb. And he has gifted you in a unique and specific way. And your years of life has matured that gift. In that anointing. It's an anointing that flows over you. And can I say to you this morning. The body of Christ needs your anointing. We miss out when your gift is not employed. You see there's too much unemployment in the church. When it comes to people using their gifts and their abilities. And we need you folks in the fourth quarter to set the example for the rest of everyone else. I'm sorry to say to the rest of us. I'm in the fourth quarter. Okay. We need you people in the fourth quarter to set the example and the pace to everyone else. What it looks like to use their unique anointing and their unique gift. You folks in the fourth quarter, you got an overflowing cup because your life is rich from things that you have learned and experienced. Good things and bad things. Successes and failures. You see, once again, the people in the other need, other three quarters need what you have to offer. So ministry at this time in your life can simply be an overflow of all that God has invested in you. Give to others out of that overflow that is within you. Hey, 60 plus peers, you know what I'm counting on? Surely, The goodness and the mercy of the Lord will follow me all the days of my life. Jehovah is good. Jehovah's mercy is new every morning. I love Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I don't know about you, but sign me up for new mercies every day when my feet hit the ground. That's why we should walk in confidence. His goodness and his mercy is going to follow me all the way to the end of my life. To the end of my fourth quarter. And lastly, we have an eternal hope. 
I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If Jehovah is your shepherd, you should not fear death. And I, I, I just hope, you folks in the fourth quarter, I hope that the thought of dying doesn't scare you. And I hope you don't live with the fear of that. If, if you do, I want to encourage you to seek somebody out and talk to them about it and get a different perspective. You see, eternal life waits for you on the other side of death. And eternal life is the anchor for your soul, as Hebrews 6 tells us. And so isn't that great that in this turbulent, crazy world that you got an anchor for your soul? And that is the hope that you have eternal life. And again, that should give you great confidence. So I'm going to ask all the 60 plus people to stand up. If you can, you need some assistance, ask the person. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that was good. That was good. Man, I got so much I want to pray for you. But first of all, I pray you walk in confidence. I'm just going to tell you, you ought to walk with some air of confidence, not cockiness. Confidence that's cloaked in humility. Can I tell you, you've got an anointing on your life. You've got a gifting on your life. And if you had, don't believe it again, I say, well, you're believing wrong. You've got an anointing and a gifting on your life that God deposited in you in your mother's womb. And I hope and pray, I pray that you just let it impact the rest of the body of Christ and the rest of the world. I pray that you will allow your overflowing cup to flow over to other people. Ministry for you should be so much about what just comes out of the depth of who you are. And who God created you to be. Bank on the goodness and the mercy of the Lord. He's been good to you your whole life. He's been merciful to you your whole life. Just bank on that. That no matter what happens to you the rest of your life, hey, I'm confident that Jehovah, my shepherd, that his goodness and his mercy is going to continue to follow me all the days of my life. And don't fear death. Because you know what's waiting for you is eternal life. We, we can't even comprehend it. We, I mean, we just don't even... Any attempt to explain it is just futile. So you got that as the anchor for your soul for the rest of your days that when you leave this earth eternal life is waiting for you and then last I want every one of you to be a spiritual mother and a spiritual father and you may think I'm not equipped I, don't, I can't do that yes you can It doesn't have to be complicated. Just be a, a willingness to give yourself, to give of yourself out of that overflow, to give out of yourself that anointing that's on your life.
I pray that all of you finish well. Let's hear for everybody in the fourth quarter. That's it. Let me just pray for all of us. Thank you, it's incredible, Father, that you being Jehovah, the existing one, would even want to be our shepherd. We're just like sheep. That's why you used that analogy from so long ago. You used that picture for us to understand, you know, we're dumb and unruly like sheep can be. And yet you want to be our shepherd. And so this right now, if there's anybody here, I don't in whatever quarter, if you've never come to that place in your life where you said, man, I need a shepherd. Just ask him right now. Just say, Jehovah, I need you to be my shepherd. I need someone to lead me, to guide me, to protect me, to comfort me. Just ask him. Repent of the other things you've looked to to shepherd you in your life make that choice and he will come and he will be your shepherd and so Father as we saw when we stood up we got people at all stages and all seasons all quarters of life and I just pray that everyone would just grab at least one thing from today's message and so I I just ask you right now what's what's at least the one thing that you're going to take with you today whatever quarter you're going to in whatever quarter you're in and then would you just be thinking about that throughout this series would you begin to pray about that one thing every day Father we want to finish well no matter what season of life we're in. I do pray especially for the people in the fourth quarter. And I pray that there could be some perspective changes that some of us are carrying around today and that you would raise up the army of spiritual mothers and fathers in this church that will go out and impact the world in their later years. And we give you today all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week for part two of Finishing Well.